Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you all for attending the second Spatial IQ for MapGeo educational webinar for this fiscal year. We've been hosting these webinars on topics that we feel are of interest to local governments with the aim of increasing your spatial IQ. We have some really interesting webinars planned for the year ahead, but as always, if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover, please reach out and let us know. Today, we're going to learn a whole lot from Jarleth O'Neill Dunn from the University of Vermont Spatial Analysis Lab about doing more with LIDAR. Local governments now have access to a wide variety of geospatial data, including LIDAR data, and they often don't use it to its full potential. So we'll talk to Jarleth about his extensive experience using LIDAR for municipal use, including urban planning, flooding modeling, tree canopy assessment, and more. So first, let's do some quick introductions of today's presenters. Um, I'm Michelle. I'm a principal and senior project manager at AppGeo, and I have been with AppGeo for about 13 years now. I've worked with many of you over the years implementing your GIS or advancing your GIS through Spatial IQ program. Um, I manage our Spatial IQ for MapGeo program, and I really look forward to continuing to help you grow your Spatial IQ through these educational webinars and the technical services that we provide. Also with us today is our LIDAR expert, Jarleth O'Neill Dunn. He's the director of the Spatial Analysis Lab at the University of Vermont. I not only look to Jarleth for his deep interest and understanding of LIDAR, um, but we also share a very important common interest in historical fiction novels, which is great when we're seeking new audiobooks to listen to. Um, Jarleth, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Yeah, just a real pleasure to be with um, all of you and excited to share the experiences that I've developed and those in my team in using LIDAR for municipal applications. Thanks. Um, we also have with us Priya Sankalia, and Priya is a project manager and also a key member of our Spatial IQ for Map Geo team. Priya, would you like to say anything? Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, thank you, Jarlath, as well, for being here with us today. I'm really excited to have you on. Um, as you know, several of you have seen me on these webinars. We've been doing them for a few years now. Um, and I hope to hope this enlightens you and brings you some more insights into uh, data that you can use and things that you can do with it. Um, and um, really, really looking forward to it. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Priya. Um, and finally, we have Aaron Doucette with us behind the scenes. Aaron is, help, is helping us with the webinar to keep it running smoothly. And he's our uh, webinar guru at AppGeo. Thanks a lot, Aaron, for your support. Right, so this is a brief overview of what we'll be covering in the presentation today. So first, I'm going to give you a really quick reminder of what Spatial IQ for MapGeo is. And then we'll get right into all the great information about how you can do more with LIDAR, starting with a very quick introduction to LIDAR, followed by discussions about various applications of LIDAR and analyses that you can do with LIDAR. Jarleth will also explain how LIDAR actually works in, um, in a way we can understand very easily and how you can get LIDAR if you don't have it already. We'll wrap up the presentation by answering questions from the audience. Um, and also throughout the presentation, we're going to be doing some audience polls and that will give us a better understanding of where you are all at with respect to LIDAR. So um, first, a little refresher on the Spatial IQ for MapGeo program. Spatial IQ is a managed service program and it's designed to help you make the most of your MapGeo subscription. So throughout the year, we can help you to strategize to advance your GIS. We can help expand your use and benefits of your GIS, and we can help you get executive buy-in, and we can do lots more and get lots of work done for you through that program. So we really challenge you to stretch the limits of MapGeo and get more information out to your staff and to the public. And the Spatial IQ program provides you with several benefits. One of the many benefits is this quarterly educational webinar series. So let's kick this off next with our first audience poll, Priya. So here's an audience poll. If you could take it, it'd be great. And we can um, and get going with this webinar. Um, before, while we are doing that, I just want to also welcome Jarlet and, um, and add to what Michelle said about him. He's just uh, been great to work with over the last few years. I've been working with him on a variety of projects, and I'm in, involving LIDAR as well. 
and um, he is just easy and you know a lot of fun and has a deep knowledge of all things GIS. So welcome, Charlotte, and thanks for helping us out on this topic today. Um, so let's see what it looks like. And um, several of you do know uh, what lidar is. Some of you don't, kind of half and half, and um, some only a little. So. Um, this is great because this is what you're going to know more about today with uh, Jarlath here. And um, I think, you know, he's going to help us, uh, you know, this whole webinar about LIDAR, but also frame uh, LIDAR in the context of municipal use cases. And I think that's really what um, we were hoping to get out of this webinar for all of you, um, how it is um, important in the context of uh, municipal government. So, um, Jarlath, it's all yours. <laughs> Great, thanks. And uh, I think when we often start these talks about LIDAR, we're wondering sort of what makes LIDAR special and what makes it unique compared to other types of overhead remote sensing. And by remote sensing, we're talking about any technology we use where we're not touching something. So most of us are very familiar, of course, with aerial imagery and orthophotos, which form the foundation of our municipal GIS and mapping efforts. But LIDAR is using near-infrared energy at least for the topographic mapping that we do. And that is a laser beam that you cannot see. So it won't, uh, it won't hurt you, it won't, be, uh, it won't be harmful to you in any way, but it is fundamentally different because it's not sensitive to things like shadows or lighting conditions. And LIDAR, unlike our imagery programs, can be flown at night. And then we can get into some of the mapping applications of, of LIDAR data and how we use it in different use cases. So let's just start off by taking a look at some areas. So this is not LIDAR, this is aerial imagery, the orthophotos can acquired under leaf off condition that many of you have in your community. And here's some LIDAR data displayed as a hillshade, so as a surface model. Now, one of the use cases of LIDAR that's becoming increasingly popular is our ability to extract things like features, particularly building footprints from the data. This is a very common use nowadays. And we can do that accurately and efficiently over large areas, particularly when we compare it to traditional manual feature extraction. Of course, with LIDAR data, we have three-dimensional information, so we can add the height attribution to those buildings giving us the capabilities to engage in 3D GIS. One of the ways in which we've used this in partnership with AppGeo is for a project in New York City where we were doing high resolution land cover mapping. And this was a situation in which the buildings were already present for the city, but they were just slightly out of date. So this is the aerial imagery. This is the LIDAR surface model there with the purple through the blue colors to the yellows, to the oranges, to the reds going from low to high in terms of elevation. And here you can see the building footprints overlaid on top of the imagery. What you'll notice here is obviously there's a brand new building there that's not included in the building footprints. If you look closely, you also see some buildings that have been removed. New York City's landscape is very dynamic. A lot of construction, especially happening during this time period, 2018. So with the LIDAR data, we didn't want to create a whole new building inventory. We wanted to be consistent with the existing planimetric data or the building footprints. And so we developed a series of algorithms that identified new buildings that were not in the existing buildings layer. We also identified buildings that had been removed or modified from the existing footprint that was present in the geospatial data. And then by identifying and extracting that information, we were able to integrate that back into the building data to provide them with a comprehensive updated building database and also a map across the city of where things have changed. And this can be, of course, particularly useful if you're looking to see, did all of these people have the appropriate zoning or other permits in place at the time? That's really amazing, um, Jarlath. I, you know, as you're talking about your next um, use case, um, I recently had a request from a client who was trying to do a site selection for a cell tower and they wanted to determine what the possible height of the tower uh, might be for the most effective coverage given neighboring buildings and vegetation and topography. Um, and, you know, we're like, okay, LIDAR can solve this. So maybe you can talk to that use case and, um, you know, put that into context for, for our listeners. Absolutely, and it's a really unique use case of LIDAR data. So back when we just had standard digital elevation models that represented the Earth's surface, the topographic surface, the bare Earth, they didn't include buildings and trees. And with LIDAR data, we get the true 3D surface. 
And not only do we get a true 3D surface, but we get it in tremendous detail. So we're able to take something like a LiDAR surface model here. This is what we call a digital surface model. It represents the 3D surface, including the buildings and the trees. We can place something like a proposed tower and it could be a camera or it could be a cell phone tower. And as long as we know information about things like the field of view and the height of that tower, we can do things like line of sight or even signal propagation. And this is used for everything such as camera sightings, cell phone tower placement, or even it's used by the Secret Service to determine if the president is out speaking somewhere where buildings are available, they actually have direct line of sight and then the Secret Service will actually work to clear those areas. So it has a variety of different interesting use cases around line of sight. Um, it's even been used actually in some forms of traffic modeling to look at potentially blind intersections. And um, so that's, that's yeah, I think mean, that's what kind of what we presented to the client as well, Charlotte. Um, so flood modeling, um, you know, we know that with a lot of our clients, we've been working with them on their uh, MS4. This is the, the permitting um, work that we need to do. But, you know, states are basically doubling down on uh, stormwater management and more stringent permitting. But you know we're going to get into all of these um, uh, effects of climate change. Flooding is one aspect that local governments are going to need to look at more and more. So um, I think in that context, um, if you could give us more insight in flood modeling and also assessing um, uh, erosion risk. Yeah, absolutely. And I think many communities, you've probably found that at least some of the outdated FEMA flood maps and DFIRM, things like that. If you've had a 100 year, 500 year flood in your community, not only are those 100 year floods happening more than every 100 years, but they probably don't actually reflect what's going on. And that's because your landscape has changed considerably. And those maps are often based on outdated elevation data. And what's interesting about LIDAR data is we've got a much more accurate and precise representation of our landscape. And this allows us to do what we see here, which is display our ortho photos in 3D. Um, but then with LIDAR data, we can strip away the above ground features, the buildings and the trees that we showed before in the digital surface model and generate something what we call a DEM or digital elevation model. And this is really what we use for flood modeling. And thanks to the detail of these data, it's really um, sort of somewhat easier and more precise to go ahead and do things like these various flood modeling exercises to see what actually might be impacted if we have these storm events. And LIDAR data is again changing for this, and it's enabling us to better represent those structures and other um, pieces of our landscape that are gonna be impacted by floods. And of course, if you can acquire LIDAR after an extreme flooding event, it better reflects the changes to your hydrologic network that have occurred from the flood. And then when we get into erosion risk, the nice thing here is that because of that level of detail, once again, our ability to model fine scale slope and aspect is much improved. So here's that digital elevation model again. Once again, we've stripped away the above ground features such as the buildings and the tree canopy. And we can do things like simple slope calculations that on a 10 or 20 meter resolution digital elevation model, we would just pick up very, very generalized conditions, but with slope mapping at this fine scale down to one meter, we can really pick up things where perhaps banks may be eroding or there's increased risk on hillsides of a failed slope that could perhaps cause a mudslide that would then cover your road. LIDAR is changing our ability to do this precise mapping um, in ways that we really never thought possible. Another example we'll go through here is uh, things like helicopter landing zones. We may not think about uh, using GIS to perhaps assist with something like a medevac, but with LIDAR we can. Here's that digital surface model, once again, representing the true 3D surface. And we can enter the parameters for specific helicopter, right? So we know based on its uh, rotor size and its footprint on the ground, the space that it needs to land upon safely and effectively. And we can plug that into the GIS and then highlight areas where that helicopter could touch down. In some cases, it may be on the tops of buildings if they're flat enough and there's not a substantial slope, or in the other cases, it could be um, select playing fields. And so this type of analysis can be really, really helpful and perhaps is something that you haven't considered using GIS for before within your organizations. 
Wow, uh, Charlotte, that's that's a lot of information that I hope um, everybody's taking in. Let's do another audience poll and um, see what um, we have here. Um, uh, let's see. So launching. Um, we're just curious to know if you have your own LiDAR data. I mean, you, you know, this could be an acquisition that you did or uh, do you know if um, there are, you know, sources that you can get to and um, and let's see what, what people have to say. There you go. Oh, um, so, you know, it, it does sound like um, some people do have their own LiDAR data. It really is a, is a mix and uh, a lot of you are not sure. And I think... Um, that's this is great because um, Jarlit's now going to sort of talk about the nuts and bolts of LiDAR, how it actually works, and then also talk about um, some technical details about LiDAR and how to get these products and, you know, how you can actually access it and, and get to work with it. Yeah, thanks, Priya. So let's go and geek out a little bit on how exactly LiDAR works so we can better understand it. And with some foundational principles, I think you'll be better positioned within your organization to understand the capabilities and limitations of LiDAR and perhaps even making purchasing decisions on how you want to move forward if you're interested in acquiring new LiDAR data. Unlike imagery, we tend to acquire LiDAR data much less often, but that's beginning to change. So as I mentioned, what's unique about LiDAR data is it's an active sensor. So it's actually shooting out this laser. Now, when it hits a hard surface like the ground or the top of the building, we just get back a single return to the sensor. But some materials, especially natural features on the landscape, such as trees, are semi-permeable to the laser. So what it does is it not only hits off the top of the tree, but then it'll often hit off branches in the middle of the tree and then make its way all the way to the ground. And this is a reason why we typically fly LIDAR during the late fall or early spring when there's no snow on the ground. And the trees, at least the deciduous trees, the broadleaf species have their leaves off so that we can get a better, better representation of the ground surface. Now, with LIDAR, we do have different ways of acquiring LIDAR data. Some of you may have survey departments, especially within your transportation agencies or organizations that do ground-based terrestrial LIDAR using a scanner. Uh, there are some drones that are acquiring LIDAR data, but most LIDAR is obtained through traditional piloted aircraft using sensors that are very expensive um, and we can acquire the data efficiently over larger areas. So the general workflow is, first of all, you pack up your plane, you've got your crew, you've got the operators, you've got your LiDAR sensor, you acquire the data, you generate different products, the specific LiDAR products, and then there may be derived products that come off of that. These could be things like tree canopy, which we'll talk about, or buildings, lots of exciting things that you can actually do with your LiDAR data to turn those data into information. So let's take a look at what LiDAR is. Well, I mentioned it's this laser that's shooting out of the plane. And so what we get is something called the point cloud. So this is the uh, Hell's Gate Bridge in New York City for a project we did with AppGeo here. And if you look closely, you see all those little dots. Those are X, Y, and Z locations. So they're 3D dots. And this is what we call the LiDAR point cloud. From a geospatial perspective, those of us that use LiDAR data, we would sort of consider this to be the raw data or the original data, but this is generally assembled by the contractor who's flown the LiDAR data. It's gorgeous, it's beautiful to look at, very large to work with and challenging. Um, but like I said, absolutely beautiful. Here's an example of New York City once again from that project. This is a Columbus Circle up at the top of the slide there and Central Park we're looking out there. A really unique way to look at the Earth's surface. Going into New York City, one of the real advantages of LiDAR data because it's an active sensor is it's just not sensitive to shadows. So if you look throughout this landscape in New York City, we can see these tall buildings and the impact they have on our ability to resolve features, right? We'd have to fly imagery at multiple times during the day if we wanted to see what was underneath or within their shadows. Now we're gonna just swing around a little bit. So we're looking at the, um, this particular image from the, um, from the east. And then we can see when we go to LIDAR data, those heavily shadowed areas are no longer obscured. We can clearly see the trees that are located within there. So we've had a lot of success in using LIDAR data to help communities map and understand their green infrastructure, their tree canopy, and the changes that have occurred. And then LiDAR data isn't just those X, Y, and Z locations, those 3D points. It also contains a wealth of information 
on things like the number of returns. So we've talked about before how in the case of trees that the LIDAR laser itself will hit off the top of the tree then multiple times through. Here we're symbolizing the LIDAR data, looking at those multiple returns. So things like the ground and the buildings generally appear blue, meaning they have lower returns, and the trees jump out here because they have multiple LIDAR returns. So the takeaway message here is that there's a wealth of information inside the LIDAR data set, inside that point cloud. It's not just about elevation. So let's talk about some of the challenges of working with LIDAR data. So it is big. It's cumbersome to work with. Uh, this doesn't mean that there's uh, not a lot of value to your organization. It just means that you do have to keep some things in mind as you're beginning to work with LIDAR data, especially among your technical resources and your hardware. So this is just a single tile from a LIDAR project, and there's over 5 million points, nearly 5.5 million points within that single tile. Um, and these points are at uh, 21 points per square meter and their scale there, their spacing means they're about 20 centimeters apart. So a tremendous amount of data in this tiny little area that you see there, very, very, very intense. Um, these points contain a host of attributes. So if you're familiar with just general vector data and point data, LIDAR data is somewhat like that. Not only do they, do they have X, Y, and Z locations that allow us to plot it out in 3D, but there's also information on the intensity. That's the strength of the signal return to the sensor. And we'll see in a little bit, we can create almost like an ortho image from it. There's also information like the number of returns, a return number, and then we get into things like the classification in which we can go in and apply algorithms and manual editing to assign those points to classes or categories, such as buildings, trees, road, or ground. And that allows us to derive additional products that can be very helpful when it comes to things like flood, flood modeling or tree canopy assessments. So let's take a look at viewing some of these different LIDAR attributes. So this is just looking at elevation, right? So this is the height of the data, and this is often done relative to sea level, okay? Now we're looking at intensity. This gives us almost like an image, um, but you'll notice that the, the tones here, the hues are, are rather funny looking. And the reason why they're funny looking is because we're looking at near infrared energy, okay? So this is much like working with a single band of, if you've worked with four band aerial imagery, looking at the near infrared portion electromagnetic spectrum. We as humans don't see near infrared light. So this generally looks a little bit uh, funny in many cases. This is elevation and intensity. This is often the optimal way in which we look at LIDAR data. It sort of adds that little bit of realism to it at the same time by allowing us to see the height. And then we've got the return type. Here we can see there's only a single return and that's typically on hard surfaces. We talked about how the buildings and the roads and the ground, we only have a single return. And then we looked in other cases where we have the first return, which occurs on the top of trees, intermediate returns in the middle of the canopy, and last returns down towards the, the uh, Earth's surface there. And then we can look at the number of returns. Similar to the last slide, we'll see higher returns among areas such as forested areas or tree canopy, and then we'll also see multiple returns on the edges of buildings or power lines when we get sort of this, almost this glint, the laser will hit off the edge and maybe get multiple returns. So a lot of information here, including things like the return number. There you can see, although the surface looks red, if we were to zoom into those trees there, we'd see a lot more. And then we have the classification. So depending on to what extent the contractor has gone through and done additional work, your points can be assigned to classes based on their type. This could be here, you can see the green represents the ground, the dark blue represents the tree canopy, the light blue that cyan color represents buildings, and then we have the red, which are points that haven't been assigned to any class, meaning they didn't fit any, into any of those categories. Having classified LIDAR, which there's more information present in the classification, generally will cost you more because this is something that the contractor is doing by applying a combination of automated algorithms and then also manual editing. So you can imagine this can not only add to the cost, but also add to the time it takes to deliver your product. So let's zoom in a little bit more and investigate these LIDAR point clouds and all the magic and beauty that they provide to us. So this particular slide here, you're gonna see those sort of looks like goalposts over those trees and some little red dots. We're gonna drop a profile over these trees here and examine these LIDAR attributes so we can better understand it. So this is the elevation profile of those trees there relative to the ground. So you can see those trees and you can see here how the LIDAR has captured a tremendous amount of information. 
Now, the amount of detail that you see is going to depend on the resolution of your LIDAR data. So this is about 20 centimeter resolution LIDAR, which is better than exists for most municipalities, but a wonderful representation of the tree. That being said, it's not a true representation of the tree. We don't see the trunk, for example, because we're looking at it from above. Okay, so it hits off that top of the trunk, but it's not a side scanning LIDAR. If we had a LIDAR sensor mounted on the ground or on our vehicle, they would actually capture the tree in its entirety. Okay, now we look at the number of returns here and we can see here that when that laser is hitting off the top of the tree, much like if it hit off the top of the building, we have single returns, and then more returns as the laser, uh, if you will, sort of trickles down through the canopy there. And then we can see the classification. These trees have been assigned to that dark blue class, which is the tree canopy class. And then if you look at the very bottom there, you see all those green points, those represent the ground. So in this case, the contractor's gone through and done considerable additional processing to separate out the trees from the ground. And this is very useful when we're making 3D measurements where we want to compute the height of features relative to the ground. Let's take a look at the profile in another area, a mix of tree canopy and buildings here. Once again, we can take a look at the profile there with the number of returns, with the building having single returns because it's a hard surface along with the ground and the trees having multiple returns. And so with this information, you can imagine that we don't just generate sort of single products from these point clouds. We often generate multiple LIDAR products that we use within our GIS. The point clouds are a little bit cumbersome to work with. And from a GIS perspective, most commonly when we work with LIDAR data, we're working on from sort of downstream, if you will, derived products. So just for context, here's some imagery for an area that we're gonna be looking at. And let's take a look at the common LIDAR products so that you're familiar with the terminology along with their capabilities and limitations. So this is that digital surface model. We've mentioned that a few times. The digital surface model is the height of all features. So that'll be ground if there's nothing above it. It'll be the building if there's a building there, and it'll be the tree canopy. The height is typically computed relative to sea level. So if you have a 20 foot building in a valley and a 20 foot building on a hilltop, those will have different elevations because of the underlying terrain. Then we have the digital elevation model. In this case, as long as the contractor has at least classified those points as ground, we can filter all away the above ground features such as the building and trees and only display the ground surface. And we do this in a rasterized format. So we've gone from points to grid cells here, and this is a digital elevation model. And these DSMs and DEMs display much more quickly in your GIS and are typically what we use for analysis as opposed to the point cloud. Everything that you see from line of sight to the HLZ, the helicopter landing zone, to the flood modeling, those are done either using digital surface models or digital elevation models in a raster format. Now we can take the DSM and subtract the DEM and we end up with a height above ground model. This is typically called an NDSM or normalized digital surface model. Incredibly valuable here because now we can get the heights of all our above ground features. In this case, you'll be able to see the heights of buildings, the heights of the tree canopy. And you'll even notice that if you look closely, you can see some of the utility lines and utility poles through there. Imagine the time savings you get in terms of doing critical infrastructure inventory, when you can just go into your GIS and measure the height of everything as opposed to having to send out survey crews to do all of that work. And then this is an intensity product. This is typically something that's less utilized from LIDAR data because it just looks funny. It's just not quite as good as your imagery, but still a valuable product that can be useful in certain cases, such as mapping impervious surfaces. Let's zoom in a little bit closer. So here's just the imagery for reference. Here's that digital surface model, true 3D representation of the Earth's surface and all its features. The DEM, now I'll just draw your attention here to some things you'll notice in those areas under the buildings. If I flip back and forth here, you're gonna notice they sort of look triangular and that's because the LIDAR sensor does not penetrate the building. So when we're generating these surface models, which are raster or gridded representations of the LIDAR data, we don't have any information under those buildings. So it ends up with this sort of triangular representation of them. So it's just important to keep in mind the limitations of LIDAR in those cases. And here's that normalized digital surface model where we're looking at the height of our ground. We can clearly see which trees are taller than which buildings. And this has a variety of use cases, including some, for example, such as looking at what trees provide uh, 
benefits that will cool those homes based on sun angle at specific times, also used to help do things like place solar panels on top of a building to know how much energy may be generated. So, Jarlit, uh, this is this you know all of this geeking out is really amazing. Uh, but I mean, and I hope that you know that gave people a lot of. Um, information and uh, context, but I think bringing it back to use cases, I find your, you know, I know you've been alluding into, to it throughout the presentation, but the tree canopy um, an analysis is really uh, fascinating to me. And I think it's really helpful for communities to know how, you know, their green infrastructure has changed over time. Um, and also, I think you're gonna talk about uh, re reducing costs and for things like this cross-section analysis for engineering departments. So um, can we bring it back to that and talk about the, the, the tree canopy analysis? Yeah, let's do that. Let's bring it back to sort of talking about how we're gonna use this. So we talked about some examples early on, things like extracting buildings. So let's come back to some imagery here and uh, let's take a look at tree canopy analysis. So many of you are struggling with your communities of dealing with everything from the urban heat island to environmental equity to reducing stormwater. And we're seeing communities across the United States invest heavily in their tree canopy. And you probably are getting questions, well, how much tree canopy do we have? Where is it? Whose control is it under? All of these different things. So let's back out here and look at that same area. And then let's take a look at tree canopy. So this is um, a project in which we developed automated feature extraction algorithms to take the LIDAR data and map trees. And you're probably wondering, well, why didn't we just use imagery? Well, in imagery, if we have a, a city, we have trees that are obscured by shadows. We also have situations in imagery where it can be difficult to differentiate trees from shrubs. And with LIDAR data, with the height information, we can get such accurate models and representations of the tree canopy that we can do these amazing tree canopy census over very large areas and then track it over time. And you can zoom in here. This is an, the results of an entirely automated process. You can see how accurate and how detailed it is and how valuable and just the cost savings of doing this either through manual interpretation or through field methods are really astronomical. Um, and because LIDAR data are 3D, not only can we map the tree canopy, but then we can go in and attribute it with information such as the height of the trees, just like we showed you early on with the building information. And this can be used as an important proxy if you're wondering about perhaps the age of your forest. And what we've seen in many communities is that when developments go in, people plant trees and then they, those trees grow and they become very robust. And then people sort of forget about them and we forget the fact that we need to maintain and manage and have a variable aged urban forest if we want it to be sustainable over time. And so we've used these data with communities to help them understand that, gosh, you know, in a huge portion of your city, all of those trees are around the same height. They were probably planted at the same time, which means they're probably gonna die off around the same time. And unless you get in there now and plant new trees, that area is gonna get a lot hotter. Those people are gonna use more energy because their homes are warmer and you're gonna have more stormwater runoff. And you can see here, just plotting that out, that information from a histogram gives this community an idea about perhaps the age distribution of their tree canopy. And they've got a lot of sort of uh, trees that I suppose are like me, they're, they're, they're middle-aged and they might wanna think about increasing the number of, of younger trees that they have. And what we've worked on with AppGeo is some exciting products, especially in uh, New York City, where we've taken LIDAR from two time periods. If you're fortunate enough to have LIDAR, from two different years and we've mapped change. So here's the tree canopy change displayed on top of the time period one. So this is 2010 data and it's a LIDAR hill shade. So you'll notice these areas which are orange, those are tree canopy loss. The purple is where the tree canopy hasn't changed and the green is new tree canopy. So we measured from time period one to time period two, in this case, 2010 to 2018. And what you'll notice here is that when we go to time period two, those orange areas appear smooth and that's because those trees have been removed. So just flipping back and forth between here, our ability not just to track our anthropogenic, our man-made infrastructure, but our green infrastructure over time is really valuable so that we can understand not just the trees that we've planted, but we can also understand what trees we perhaps lost due to invasive species or storms or any of those types of things. And we'll go into other things here that perhaps you traditionally did with field crews, such as stream cross sections, an important part of 
looking at the uh, resiliency of your hydrologic network, and this is often done before you perhaps place things like a culvert or a bridge. And with LIDAR data, it's not to say that we shouldn't go to the field anymore, but these very time intensive field exercises that would be extremely costly and sometimes depending on your streams, difficult to do, we can do now with LIDAR data. So this is an example of that area we just looked at. Going in, we're dropping a line there down the tholweg or the main channel of the stream. And then we're doing cross-section profiles. So we have complete elevation profiles for each and every one of those cross-sections. And using our geospatial software, we can select a specific cross-section such as we see here and look at that profile to better understand our hydrologic network. And there we are just moving to a different cross-section. Once again, things that we used to do through very, very detailed on the ground GPS surveying can now be augmented or in some cases perhaps even replaced by making use of LIDAR data. So it doesn't matter if you're talking stream, stream cross sections or perhaps construction planning, LIDAR data can really help your communities. Good time for one more poll. Um, I, we were hoping to, I mean, kind of wanting to know whether after listening to uh, Charlotte and all the study we've learned about, would you consider using LIDAR for a project? So if you want to go ahead and vote, uh, we can see how people feel. Um, we've got about 25% have voted. And let's go ahead and uh, close this. And well, there we go, Jarlet. <laughs> it looks like a lot of people would consider using it. And I think it's uh, nobody said no. So that's great. And some are not sure. Um, this is a, a, a good you know, sort of segue into uh, your telling us about how people can get LIDAR data and, and sort of, uh, I don't know if you could call it a, um, a spoiler alert, but um, you, know, you don't always need to buy LIDAR data. It is available um, uh, you know, through the state, um, but um, if you did, then you know, that's what you need to keep in mind. So I'll let Jarla talk more about um, you know, where you can get data and, um, and, and you know, maybe if you take your questions after that. Yeah, so some of you may be aware that you have LIDAR because your community could have purchased it, but in other cases, it could have been done by the county, regional planning commission, state, or even a federal agency. And so you're wondering, well, gosh, you know, this sounds great. Joel has talked about all these cool things about LIDAR, but how do I find it? Um, the best and most comprehensive place that I start for finding LIDAR is the United States Interagency Elevation Inventory. So if you just type that into your favorite search engine like Google, U.S. Interagency Elevation Inventory, you'll come up with this website. Um, I typically like to turn off on the right there all of the um, different types of collects aside from topographic LIDAR. That's the LIDAR that you'll most often work with for your municipal planning. There's other types of LIDAR that we didn't talk about. Uh, bathymetric LIDAR, for example, which is used for hydrographic surveys and is rarely available. And then there's other things, multi-beam bathymetry. These are sort of very, very unique and rare data sets. So topographic LIDAR, and if you look here in the Northeast, for example, there's a lot of LIDAR out there. We've got full coverage. And here I am just clicking on that little map pin location in Northern Vermont in the Missisquoi watershed up near the Canadian border. And then it's highlighted all those blue polygons with ones with the outlines, those are all part of a single LIDAR collect. And I can see there that data access is available through the national map. So if I want to get the LIDAR products, I can go to the national map. I can also scroll down there and find out more information about those LIDAR collects. The other thing is that many states maintain LIDAR portals. And so, for example, if you're in Vermont, uh, the VCGI, the Vermont Center for Geographic Information, has LIDAR data not only available for download, but they also have many services, uh, the DEMs, the DSMs, the NDSMs, those height above ground models that we talked about, even things like slope, they've got those as web services that you can stream into your favorite geospatial software package. Uh, similar capabilities exist with Max, GIS in Connecticut, in Rhode Island. So don't just go to the interagency elevation inventory portal. Well, that'll give you a good idea that there's coverage out there. Uh, the state portals often provide additional services where you may not even need to download the data because you can make use of these web services that enable you to harness massive amounts of, uh, of information. So now we can touch on, great, um, maybe you're happy using the LIDAR out there, but 
what if you really are inspired by this talk today and you want to um, you want to purchase LIDAR data, right? You've found yourself sitting on your municipal trust fund or end of year funds or whatever it is, or you can really make use of the cost, uh, I think the cost benefit analysis from LIDAR data to improve your community. So four things that I really think are important when considering LIDAR data. Um, and these all have cost implications associated with them. So one is really the resolution, and that's sort of the point spacing. Um, how many points per square meter or per square foot do you want? And the USGS has great guidance on this, and you'll find these are called the QL or quality level specifications. And so most LIDAR data that falls into this QL2 category right now that is typically available has uh, several points per square meter, or you can go into this QL1, which is the data that we looked at in this demo, and there you're talking eight to maybe even 20 points per square meter. But once again, just like with imagery, if you want more resolution, you're going to pay more. Next is we talked about classification. So at a minimum, you want to be able to separate the ground points from the above ground points. And that allows you to do things like compute the height above ground of features, which we discussed is very, very valuable. To the extent that you want other points classified, bridges, roads, buildings, and tree canopy, you really should think carefully, do you have those features mapped already? And if you do, it's probably not worth spending extra money to have those points identified. The reason being that you're not going to work with points in your GIS, you're going to work with polygons and lines. So if you already have your roads mapped or your buildings in your planimetric data set, it's probably not worth it to pay a lot of extra money to have a point classification. Now, the other thing that's really important is hydro treatment. So do you want your water to appear nice and flat? And do you want to be able to run hydrologic analyses with your data, meaning that you can route the flow downhill? That can require uh, considerable investment. So an example is dealing with culverts, which are under a road. From a LIDAR perspective, the water, it doesn't see the culvert, it just sees the road. So the water stops at that particular culvert. So hydro treatments like ensuring flow connectivity require often a contractor to go through and sort of bust through those roads, for example. But that is crucial if you're looking to do accurate flow modeling like flood mapping. And the other thing is to consider derived products. We talked about some of those surface models here, and then also things like buildings and tree canopy or tree canopy change. Those may be something that the contractor does or that you pay someone else to do, or you do that in-house, but just make sure you budget for those services and things that you may be interested in. Um, this leads to sort of, well, what do you need to work with LIDAR? And chances are that most of you are in a position to at least work with basic LIDAR products right now. Uh, because you've got the GIS. So um, make sure, first of all, that you come up with an application. We showed you some today. Those aren't comprehensive or all-inclusive, but think about something where LIDAR may help you. Um, software, the good news is that most software packages right now will allow you especially to work with these surface models, digital surface models, the digital elevation models, the normalized digital surface models, those can all be ingested into ArcGIS, QGIS, Global Mapper. And then we've seen these software packages increasingly add capabilities to view point clouds as well. So in most instances, you don't need to look at the point cloud to do any analysis, but it can be nice simply because, well, they're, they're beautiful to look at. Um, hardware, do note, especially if you get into point cloud analysis, that you do need things like nice graphics cards and a, a lot of memory to effectively uh, effectively work with them. And then people, uh, as always, as part of any GIS, right, you need folks who are technically adept and trained and have experience. And LIDAR is one of those things I certainly didn't learn in my undergraduate course, and most of us have picked it up along the way. But you do want to develop experience with LIDAR data, not just LIDAR in general by attending things like this webinar, but maintain experience and develop uh, an understanding of the particular LIDAR data set for your community, because you'll find that there's lots of great things about that, and you'll probably also find some limitations associated with it as well. Wow. <laughs> I, uh, 
have to say that that was so much great information, Jarlith. Um, you're kind of a rock star right now. I uh, you have so much deep knowledge in all of this and explain it all so well in a way that is really understandable to non-technical folks. I really appreciate that. I think my uh, favorite part was um, learning about the the usefulness of the um, of lidar for when you have the shadowing and the around the buildings and you are still able to identify the trees um, that are there near the buildings, um, which you wouldn't be able to do from ortho imagery. And of course your anecdote about um, the president's line of sight at a speech. <laughs> um, great, so um, to wrap it up, uh, in summary, um, you know, AppGeo with the help of Jarlith and his spatial analysis lab, um, we can help you with this. We can help you um, answer your questions with LIDAR. We can help point you in the right direction, uh, depending on your particular use cases. We can help you acquire the data. We can help you manage the project to acquire the data and QC and everything. Um, we can provide you guidance on the resources available to you. The bottom line is that we're here to help. Um, and you know we can brainstorm ideas with you and we just we love to help solve problems that's what we do and most of all we're here to help you raise your spatial iq um so with that said we're going to switch over now to some questions from the audience we've got about 12 minutes take a peek at those here all right we have some good questions here um the first one is can we use um drone can we can we use the drone that we have for capturing lidar, and does it need to have any special specifications for lidar? Yeah, thanks, Michelle. And we put together some slides because we anticipated this question. So, um, lidar sensors come in all shapes and sizes. Actually, I think the iPhone 12. Um, once again, if you come into I don't know twelve hundred dollars or whatever that costs, that actually has a lidar sensor on it. You're not going to be able to use your LiDAR sensor on your iPhone 12 to map your community, but you can actually generate a 3D model of your chair with it. Um, you can also mount LiDAR sensors on drones. You're going to need a fairly robust drone for that. It's going to weigh in the tens of pounds, and those LiDAR sensors are probably going to start at around $50,000 going up to over $200,000. They're, they're not cheap. In addition, uh, this is not something you're just going to mount on your DJI Phantom or or uh, other sort of simple drone. But let's take a look at some of the um, things as it relates to drone mapping, because some of you may have drone programs and you've seen 3D models generated from drones. Those are generated from imagery through a process we call photogrammetry, uh, much like our eyes perceive 3D. As long as we have overlapping data and images, we can generate 3D models. So in this case, uh, this is a recent product we did of a somewhat mixed agricultural forested area. Over on the left there is the imagery we acquired. You're gonna notice the trees appear gray. This was this was pretty recently, so they were leaf off. We can see some of the green ones there, the coniferous species. And then we can see sort of the, the, the um, low vegetation, shrubby vegetation in yellow there. The LIDAR, normal, LIDAR digital surface model there, we can see the canopy is really, really well represented. And then in the imagery derived, 3D product, digital surface model, we see a much poorer representation of the canopy. It appears really triangulated. So you can generate 3D models uh, from drone-based photogrammetry from just imagery alone. However, it's just not the same thing. And then if you do want to go to drone-based LiDAR, just keep in mind, it's gonna cost you um, quite a bit of money, especially if you want a nice and robust sensor. And you're still very limited with drones on the area that you can acquire in a given flight um, because these systems are heavy. Right, thanks, Jarlath. Um, so the next question is, um, does it make sense to get our building footprints layer updated using LIDAR? Yeah, uh, I think going back to that example we shared from New York City, the, the nice thing with, with LIDAR is, and where you want to use it sensibly, in my opinion, is you don't want to remap all of your buildings. What you do want to do is, if you do happen to have LIDAR, is you can use it to update your buildings. And you can find those buildings that have lost elevation, perhaps they've been demolished, modified. You can find buildings that have been added quite easily using LIDAR data. And it gives you a very efficient way, not to create a brand new buildings layer, but to build on your existing work. So you only have to go in and map 
what's been modified as opposed to remapping your entirety of your community and potentially generating a new layer that doesn't quite agree with your old one. So it can make your map building mapping uh, efforts much more efficient. Great. Um, and then the last question here is, um, how can I use LIDAR data to enhance my utilities information? Um, I've heard of people using it to populate elevation. Yes, so um, great question. Um, a lot of that determines on how detailed your LIDAR data are. Do they have the resolution? So utility companies, when they're managing their major transmission lines, will often fly LIDAR in a helicopter very, very um, close to the ground comparative to most of the mapping that you'll see on the interagency elevation inventory. And they typically also don't share those, uh, those data with anyone. And they'll typically fly at 40 to 50 to maybe 60 points per square meter. A resolution we'll never often see in sort of broader area mapping um, projects. But you will notice that as long as you have sort of QL2 LIDAR that has a few points per square meter, you'll be able to spot most of your utility poles and you'll be able to get accurate height measurements from them. You'll also see your uh, utility lines in that data. It won't appear as a line, it'll appear as little dots where the LIDAR is hit it, but you'll also be able to obtain the elevations of those. And that can be very useful, especially if you're thinking about construction projects or perhaps even tree planting projects to identify areas where, for example, utility lines need to be taken into consideration. For example, you wouldn't want to plant tree species near a utility line that are gonna to grow to a height that they would then interfere with that utility line. You'd probably want to take, select a species that would grow much shorter. So LIDAR data can be very useful in those types of planning activities. And that is a situation where the surface models that we showed you are probably not suitable. You want to go back to the original point cloud to do those types of detailed analyses. Yeah, great. And and um, I know we've also applied LIDAR um, elevation attribute information to things such as manhole covers um, and catch basins and such to supplement going out in the field and getting the elevation there if, if that's not an option for municipality. Um, so that wraps up our questions. And I just noticed, sorry, Aaron, I just noticed that your hand has been raised for for a while, and I'm not sure if you have the ability to ask a question um, to, to speak in this webinar format. Um, but if you want to pop a question into the into the box, the question box, I'm happy to try to answer it <laughs> or let Jar <laughs> Um Oh, that was an accident. Okay, no problem. Thank you. All right. Well, that wraps it up. Um, thank you all so very much for joining us today and spending your hour of your afternoon with us. Um, we look forward to seeing you all on our next Spatial IQ webinar. Again, if you have any um, specific topics you want us to address, please reach out um, and we'll be happy to put it in the queue. Thanks a lot. Have a good afternoon. Uh, thanks, thanks Thank Charlotte. It was really helpful. Thank you. Yes.